And today, for my quick sermon, actually I say it's quick, but it's still four pages long. That could be 45 minutes for all we know. But we're going to try to be at Time and Tide at 1.30 for those who ordered their meals. Amen. And I hope that you can make it to Time and Tide and join us for extended fellowship, Christmas carols, and just a good time together, just thanking God and just being together. I mean, just having you. We're thanking God for each other. Amen. Amen. Thank God we have each other. Amen. So please do join us. I want to talk today about the benefits of gratefulness. Okay, you might think that being grateful makes you happy, and happy is good, but it does so much more than that. It really does. Have you ever talked to someone who is sort of just kind of dragging their feet and lethargic, and, and you might say, hey, what's, what's happening, you know? And they could tell you a balance of the good and the bad, but they pretty much just tell you all the bad. And they're trying to get you down too. And they're trying to get you to say, yes, you have every good reason to be disappointed and sad and dragging your feet today. I agree, but, but that's not the kind of person we need to be. And that's not the kind of person they need to be. Amen. We need to be grateful. Amen. So I have a question for you. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Now, of course, if you're a born-again Pentecostal who believes the Bible, we know it's the chicken. Amen. But this is a real puzzle for evolutionists. For those who don't believe in God, it's a real struggle. Which did come first? It's a real conundrum. And, um, you know, because if something's supposed to invent itself slowly over millions of years, you know, would it evolve as an adult or as an egg? And maybe the safest answer to that question for any atheist who doesn't believe in God's incredible, powerful creation is slime. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Slime. Okay. It doesn't make sense. It's not supposed to. Okay. But how about this? Which came first, success or happiness? You might think that success, that success produces happiness. And in a way, it does. If you've ever achieved a couple things, you're sort of like, yeah, I can do so. I can do a couple things. This is good. I'm making progress. But we humans, regretfully, we're complicated. Yes. Amen. I did, a, I did a master's in counseling where you study human psychology, and you discover just how conflicted we humans are. We are our own worst enemies sometimes, overthinking, under, under, underdoing. Yes. And <laughs> And, uh, and it's odd, because we have the greatest technology for comfort, health, food, entertainment, communication. We are at the apex of the human race at the moment. Every year, we're healthier, we're safer, we're wiser, we're more connected to the ones we love, no matter where they live in the world. And yet, suicide is the leading cause of death for teenagers. Anxiety affects 14% of Australia. And serious depression affects 5%. Now think about it. The poorest people in the world are often undernourished without access to basic services like electricity, clean drinking water. They have less access to education, and they suffer, therefore, from much poor health. How could we possibly fail to be happy? How do we do it? How do we take such... How do we take... How, how do we snatch defeat right out of the jaws of victory? How do we do that? The average Australian is living in a top 10% of wealth in the entire world. Now we're probably looking at each other, we're looking at the people in the city, we're looking at other people who live in Australia, but honest, there's a whole lot more people in Africa and Asia, especially those living in communist countries who are living in abject poverty. Even poor people in this country, people who legally are considered poor, are still in the top 10% of wealth of the entire planet. 60,000 bucks a year, 400 bucks in a bank, 2,000 bucks in credit card debt, and you are in the top 10% of the world. In this world, we have families living under bridges or in cardboard boxes. And us, many of us live in a house. Our, our car has a house. Our dog has a house, and people are living under bridges and living in cardboard boxes, and we're sad. We drag our feet, oh, woe is me. I don't have it as good as the Johnsons. Look, they got a boat and a jet ski in front, and I don't have that, and woe is me. 
Amen. We are rich, brothers and sisters. We are rich. Now, whenever my kids used to ask me, are we rich? Because of all these things I've just described to you, I said, we're rich. We are rich. Now, we might not be rich compared to the Johnsons down the street with the boat and the jet ski, or the people with the triple-sized house, or the people who live in gated communities. We're not anywhere near as rich as Trump, but we're rich, and we better understand that. Psalms 95. There we go. It says, oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and let us shout joyfully to him with songs. For the Lord is a great God and the great king above all gods. Amen. Now, the first sermon I ever heard Brother Stone King preach, I was just coming out of the Baptist faith, having been a Baptist for five years, Bible College of Baptists, and I heard the most incredible sermon I've ever heard in my entire life preached by Brother Stone King, and it was basically worship our entrance into God's presence. You enter into God's presence by being grateful, by being thankful. You enter into God's presence by being appreciative. How peculiar, how peculiar that he should do that. And I believe that it's a choice to be happy and it's a choice to be sad. Now, sometimes deeper into the amygdala, beneath our thinking processes of our brains, things might kick in and, and cause anxiety and depression. I'm not talking about that, but for everyone who has a healthy amygdala, if everyone who has a normal set of faculties and no traumas, amen, we can easily choose to be happy or easily choose to be sad. And I think we do it on a regular basis, and I think we really need to choose to be grateful. Amen? We need to choose to be grateful. Oh, you can try to bring me down with you if you want to. You can try to tell me this sad story, this sob story, but we are rich. We're richer than 90% of the humans on this planet. Thank God. We didn't choose to be born here. We didn't vote to be born here. We didn't struggle. We didn't arm wrestle for the privilege of being born here. God just happened to place us here. We had better be appreciative. Amen? I say, let's choose it. Let's choose to be happy. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Lord Jesus, and we are so grateful, so privileged, Lord Jesus. We have no idea. Many of us are looking at our lack of privileges. We do have some limitations here and there, and we can focus on those and make those the story of our life. But Lord, I think over and over you told us in the Bible to make you the story of our lives, that we can identify with you, and we can identify with Christ, and we can identify with the victory we receive through salvation in the blood. And Lord Jesus, we are heavenly bound, Lord God, and we pray that you'll help us, Lord God, to be joyful all the way, Lord God. Help us not to be sucking on lemons and, and being sad and grumpy and irritable and, and turning on the, the, the self-entitled mentalities that cause misery. But Lord, help us to be grateful people. That when people see us, they say, wow, these Christians, they are grateful, appreciative. They might not have everything everybody else has, but they've learned to be content in whatever state they are. And I want to have that kind of mentality. Lord, help us to be that kind of an example, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So you heard me correctly. Okay, you heard me correctly. Happiness is a choice. Amen. We are the most blessed people on the planet, but that doesn't guarantee happiness. Amen. Like we might suspect. In fact, not even rock star success guarantees happiness. I've read lots of biographies. And it doesn't take maybe two or three pages to get into it before the person says at the apex of their career, yeah, I've got everything I've always wanted, but I'm just not happy. Let's... Let's not raise our hands. I'm just going to do a rhetorical question here. How many of you think that having lots of money would make you happy? You would normally think so, right? How about having millions of people loving you and adoring you and thinking everything you do is great? How many of you think would make that you happy? We would think so too. But these people have all of that. Surprise. It hasn't made them happy. Not even winning millions in the lottery brings happiness. I mean, 95% of people who win the lottery win big 
You know, you, you chase them down five years later and they're the most miserable people you've ever met. Amen. In fact, there was only one family I know who did a great job and it was actually a Lebanese family who won a lottery here in Australia. They actually took that money and invested it into a food kitchen in the city. He's still working his job. I don't know if I would have the character to do that. He's still working his job and he's giving. He's giving to those who are less advantaged. And I tell you what, this man's a happy man. This man's a happy man indeed, giving. Amen, he's doing what Jesus said. It's better to give than to receive, amen. So all these things that we normally think would solve all of our problems and make us happy, they don't make you happy. Humans think that situations bring happiness. But psychologists know that only those who remember to be happy actually are happy, amen? Amen. It's a choice. It's a choice every day. Amen. And I try to make that choice every day for the longest time. It's, it's been good for me because when you counsel lots of people, I did a lot of counseling for the government when I was doing my training. Whoo, man, you are taking on some heavy weights and you're hearing some sad stories, some rough challenges, and you're, you're counseling people who are really, they, they got some, they're, they're in some deep pits, you know, but, but there's a way out. Step by step, there's a way out. And it's easy. You can take all that on and you can walk home 20 times heavier, 20 times more miserable. And I've had to learn how to, I had to learn how to, how to self-medicate myself and say, Lord, you know, this is, that's their story, that's their challenge. I got to get back to my story and my challenge. Amen. And you have to learn how to not let those weights drag you down. Amen. Choosing to be happy. What does it say in 1 Thessalonians 5? Paul gives some, you would think it's advice, but it's actually instructions. He says, rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now that's pretty exhaustive there. Give thanks in all circumstances. This is God's will for you. So we are commanded to be thankful. We are commanded to be happy. How do you command someone to be happy? Paul's telling us to be happy. Is that even possible to obey? Yes, I believe it absolutely is. At all times in life, we have wonderful things to be thankful for and some not so wonderful things to be sad for, amen? But the cool thing is, and think about it, just as, just as those great things can't force us to be happy like we would expect them to be, the sad things, they can't force us to be sad either. Amen? You, what you do is you try to find a weakness, you know? What's the weakness? And the weakness is if happy situations can't force you to be happy, and if sad situations can't force you to be sad, then you realize, I'm free! I can choose to be happy in hard times. What did Paul say? I have found out how to be content in all states. And he lists some happy ones and he lists shipwreck. He lists some more happy ones and he mentions prison. He says, I've learned to be content in whatever state I'm at. And if sad things can't force me to be sad and happy things can't force me to be happy, it comes down to me and I have an instruction from God to choose happy, so I'm going to choose happy. Amen. No guilt involved. No guilt. Amen. I don't know if maybe someone might be feeling guilty, but how can I be happy when there's people starving in the world? How can I be happy when people are living in cardboard boxes? But we have to say, listen, you know, if God's given us a command, we've got to do it without guilt. Now, the Bible tells us what to do. Science and psychology tells us what's happening in the background. According to psychologists and doctors, gratitude causes the brain to produce, um, where did I have this here? Dopamine and serotonin. These are little chemicals in the brain, amen? Now, dopamine is that feel-good neurotransmitter. It's associated with pleasure and reward. It contributes to focus, motivation, and happiness. When you do something that feels good, dopamine's released, and you feel good. And serotonin is a chemical that's considered a natural mood stabilizer, so you're not sort of up and down, bouncing off the walls. But it helps you to regulate anxiety, reduce depression, and heal wounds, and maintain bone health. These chemicals are released 
when you simply exercise, not happiness, but gratitude. You know, happiness is like, you know, going to the amusement park and riding on a ride and doing some crazy stuff. Anyone can do that. But gratitude is when you're pointing outside of yourself and saying, you know what? I'm grateful for this person. I'm grateful for this event in my life. I'm grateful for this success. I'm grateful for this person who helped me succeed. In fact, last year on my bucket list, I made a point to identify three people who blessed me at key points in my life and blessed them. They're all in America, but I hunted them down and I gave them a gift and a letter saying, thank you for that time in my life where you helped me make an incredible transition for the better. And I tell you what, that felt good doing that. It really did feel good. I don't, I don't know what they're thinking reading this. You know, we often think, you know, what, in fact, I know one of the guys, he was kind of going through a bit of a hard time. He was a chaplain at a nursing home, and he really didn't feel like that was a great achievement in God's eyes. He wanted to be a pastor, not a chaplain in a nursing home. I know he was going hard on himself. And I tell you what, I hope that my letter helped him to realize that you made a world of difference in my life. And I'm not going to forget that. Someone out there loves you and appreciates you and remembers you on a regular basis fondly. And I hope that, hope that helped pick him up a little bit. Amen? Be happy when commanded to by God or when reminded by the worship leader, hey guys, let's all rejoice. Starts us on a cycle that's empowering and health inducing. In other words, God created us to use happiness and gratefulness to generate healthy well-being, motivation, and um, personal growth development and inspiration for otherness. Grumpiness, who knows, may be of the devil after all. Turning on the Karen might not be such a healthy thing to do. Amen. Sorry to all the Karens out there, but that's a phrase they use, you know. Um, that's why we have holidays. Think about it. God gave Israel seven celebrations to celebrate. And then they added two more over time. In the book of Esther, they added Purim for, for surviving the attack from Haman. And then Hanukkah was added in 1 Maccabees because they actually were able to conquer the, te uh, the temple back and kick out the Syrians. And, um, and they recovered the temple. And so they're still celebrating the recovery of the temple from the Syrians. Amen. And, and holidays encourage our faith to anticipate more of the goodness of God in the future. Amen. We are loose. We are set free to enjoy today because we don't have to fear tomorrow. Amen. And that's the story of holidays. And I hope that no one here does fear tomorrow. Some people do. Some people have an anxiety about tomorrow because they don't know what's happening tomorrow. And they may have had some hard times in the past. And, you know, you get, you get this mentality that, that the only way to make sure the future is going to be happy is if I'm totally in control of all the variables. And we have to learn to take our hands off of the variables and trust God. It's a little crazy. It's a little reckless. But you'll learn that when you don't have to be in control of everything, you can truly be happy once you get there. It takes a little while to realize that the future is not so scary as you imagined it would be, and it's really scary to let your hands go. We often discover when our hands are all over something, trying to fix and control things, we often break things and make them bad in the process of trying to make them good. So we gotta learn to just let go and let God, amen? When they say let go and let God, that just means, hey, trust God for the future. And the first couple times will be scary, but look back, reflect, and say, hey, was it as scary as I thought it was going to be? Was it as sad and depressing and devastating as I was imagining it was going to be? And you'll say, no, it wasn't. After a little while, you'll get the hang of it. Amen. And you'll learn to not fear tomorrow. Now, this sounds logical. Be happy now to be happy later. But can appreciation and gratefulness be any more strategic than that? Why, yes, God gives it to us in a very strategic manner. Romans chapter 5, Paul says, not only so, but we also glory in sufferings. Whoa, wait a second. <laughs> Who let that guy in the building? Glory in sufferings? Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Amen. 
So yeah, that story sounds pretty sad at the beginning, sufferings, but he realizes that sufferings are gonna take me somewhere. Sufferings are gonna take you somewhere that joy can't take you and pleasant tidings can't take you. How about James? Maybe James is gonna bring us some hope. He says, my brethren, count a little joy when you fall into various trials. Whoa, stop, where are these guys, what are they reading? What are they doing to us? Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect or mature and complete, lacking nothing. Yeah, we want the end of that, don't we? We want the end state, but we don't want the first half. We don't want the trials that get us there. Why do these spiritual heroes tell us to, to be happy when we're in the middle of situations which are logically designed to make us sad? When I'm in a bad situation, Aren't I supposed to be responding sadly? No, of course not. We've been commanded to give thanks in all situations because happiness is a choice. And happiness is the only path out of this misery where you're actually going to have a good result. There's probably many paths out of this misery, but if you want to have maturity, if you want to have stability, if you want to have perseverance and character and hope, you're going to have to push through your challenges and your trials and your sufferings with thanksgiving. It's funny that both these passages begin to lay out the reasons why this statement is true. Nobody asked them for the explanation, but they both gave it to us immediately because they knew this doesn't normally make sense. They knew we would want this. So what are the results of suffering and joy? Well, suffering plus joy equals perseverance, character, and hope. We want that. We just don't want the suffering. But if we can add joy to it, now joy doesn't mean, hey, happy, happy, joy, joy. It just means that I know that I've got a savior. I've got a shepherd. I don't need to fight this thing myself. I don't need to conquer this thing myself. I have a shepherd who's gonna be with me and get me through this. So even though I might have a bit of sadness, you know, maybe I lost a loved one or I lost a couple thousand dollars in some sort of shifty hacker, I know that I've got joy running in the background because I understand, you know, I'm in the top 10% of population wealth in the entire planet and I've got a savior, I'm heaven bound. No matter what happens on this planet, when it's all said and done, I'm gonna be in God's presence and in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. At his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. So we see the math, do the math. Suffering plus joy equals perseverance, character and hope. Trials plus joy equals patience and maturity, lacking nothing. Now, who wants to use, who wants these amazing gifts? Well, they only come through trouble. Nobody wants trouble, but we all want the patience and perseverance. You have to earn them so you can keep them. So when trials and suffering come, try to take it with thanksgiving. Amen. One man said he changed his response when he was given bad news. And it's helped him deal with bad news a lot better. It helps him to keep his eyes open, to look for the hope, to look for the solution, rather than looking for the exit door, looking for where he can go have a pity party. It, when he changes response, he now has a solution, a, an attitude that will take him towards long-term growth. And this guy is not a Christian. Instead of saying, oh no, or, I'm never going to be able to financially recover from this, or I'm ruined, or this is the worst day of my life, this man simply now says, that's interesting. Hey, sir, we, uh, we, we, we misplaced about a quarter of a million dollars. That's interesting. Brings up some bad news. That's interesting. And, and by saying that's interesting, rather than your normal pity party kind of stuff, the door's open for not only a solution for today, but for a solution that will work for the rest of his life to make sure he doesn't lose a quarter of a million dollars anymore. Amen? In fact, as a pastor, whenever my wife says, oh, we got a problem, I'm now saying, hmm, that's interesting. I can't wait to find out what it is because problems happen. And they could, as any problem can happen, you know, 10 times in a year or 10 times in a lifetime. But if I can solve it the first time, hopefully I'll be able to reduce it incredibly in the future. Amen. So no more getting knocked into a downwards depression path. 
you now we can view the problem long-term friend to lead them into future growth and maturity. So what do you say when you get bad news? That's interesting. What do you say when someone brings you bad news? Someone says, hey man, you got troubles. This, is, this, this big thing happened. Amen. Do that. Amen. Because you've got a God. You know, the troubles aren't the final messenger. Our God's the final messenger. Whose report are you going to believe? We will believe the report of the Lord. Amen. I could go on and on, but let me leave the Bible's wisdom on screen while I share with you the psychological benefits of appreciation, gratefulness, joy, and thanksgiving, which has been documented by doctors in psychology. Proverbs 17.22. Didn't realize I had that there. It says, A merry heart does good like medicine. This is in the age before psychologists, in the age before scientists, but a broken spirit dries the bones. Okay, what, what does science say? Science says gratitude opens the door to more relationships. Happy people and grateful people are attractive and desirable to other people. It's not just looks, but a happy face, a happy personality a successful personality, an overcoming resilience, bounce back personality, that's attractive to people. Grateful people experience fewer aches and pains and are more likely to take care of their health. Gratitude reduces a multitude of toxic emotions and increases happiness and reduces depression. Gratitude enhances empathy for other people and reduces aggression. People were less likely to retaliate against others even when given negative feedback and had a decreased desire to seek revenge. That's just the result of being a grateful person by nature, or should I say, by choice. When you choose to be a grateful person, you'll have these benefits. Grateful people sleep better. Spend 15 minutes jotting down a few things you're thankful for before going to bed. They say you'll sleep better and longer. Gratitude improves self-esteem. Rather than becoming resentful towards other people who have more money or better jobs, a major factor in reduced self-esteem, grateful people are able to appreciate other people's accomplishments. Can you do that when someone gets a promotion that you want? Can you be thankful for them? Can you be happy for them if when someone gets a blessing that you want, you can't afford it or you, or you didn't qualify for it, they got it? That's a sign that you're doing something right if you can be happy for them, sincerely. Gratitude increases your mental strength it not only reduces stress, but it also plays a major role in overcoming trauma. Recognizing all that you have to be thankful for, even during the worst times, maybe even especially during the worst times, fosters resilience. That's that spring back sort of flexibility rubber bands have. You know, you got a rubber band, looks pretty. I have these rubber bands in the shape of dinosaurs. And I use them for months on end. I, take them off and put them on the table. Hey, it's a dinosaur again. I thought for sure it wouldn't bounce back to being a dinosaur. They're very resilient. Amen. They, they can spring back. And we need to be that way too. We need to spring back. Amen. Hard times, spring back. Hard times, stretches, spring back. Difficult times, challenges, trials, spring back. Okay, I'm wrapping up here. Gratitude allows a person to celebrate the present. Gratitude allows a person to block toxic emotions like envy, resentment, regret, depression. We don't want those. We don't need those. God doesn't want, even want you to have that. So if you can be thankful, you can re it's easier to resist those things. Gratitude allows you to be more stress resilient and strengthen social ties and social worth. Let's all stand. And I'm going to talk to you about, just for a second, the ingratitude. Ooh, what does ingratitude do? Are you a person who walks around always envious of other people? Are you unthankful? Un ingratitude causes people to be excessive in their sense of self-importance. They're the ones walking around thinking they're entitled to everything. Ingratitude causes people to be vain and arrogant. Ingratitude causes people to have an unquenchable need for admiration and approval. I must be respected. How dare you? And ingratitude causes people to have a sense of entitlement. So as we celebrate Christmas and as we celebrate another year together as a church with each other, look around each other, man. These are some beautiful people God's given us in our lives, amen? And honest, he's made them even more beautiful, amen?
He should have seen me before he got me. Amen. Now I'm all clean and pretty and happy and more pleasant. But before he got a hold of me and before he got a hold of you, amen, we needed a bit of work. Amen. So let's rejoice in the fact that this is God's will for us. You've been commanded to do a happy thing, to be grateful, to be thankful. Amen. Let's be happy now and let's have a successful next year. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Hallelujah, Lord God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this time to come together and, and just consider, Lord God, the health benefits, Lord God, of being grateful. If anyone is actually sort of letting gratefulness slip them by, if they're, if they're not taking time to be thankful and appreciative, Lord, help remind them, Lord Jesus, to be more grateful, Lord God. We are abundantly blessed. And it's ridiculous that we allow ourselves, the devil, to just walk all over us and, and convince us to be sad and bitter and, and miserable and anxious and depressed, Lord God. Help us not to give him that right, Lord God, but help us by following your recipe of being grateful in all situations, the good and the bad. Lord Jesus, he can't bring us down. Amen. He can't get us to imagine that the problem is bigger than our Savior. Amen. But if we focus on the problem, the problem is going to look a lot bigger than our God. And, and that will be a cause for dilemma. That will be a cause for disappointment, Lord Jesus, and sadness. But we understand, Lord God, that we're going to be grateful. We're going to be thankful in all situations, Lord God. Hallelujah. We're going to remember to be grateful. We're going to remember. We're going to write down our blessings, Lord Jesus. We're going to sit back and even think about our blessings. And just maybe every night or every morning, take a few seconds and just think of three things we're grateful for, Lord God. And I pray that that will help us, Lord Jesus, to be those, those happy, um, what do you call it, Lord? Those, those Christians who are just addictive. You just want to have them in your life and you want to be like them. Help us to be those kinds of Christians, Lord, in the workplace and in the family and at school, Lord God. Help us just to be lovers of people and lovers of life and grateful, Lord Jesus. And we pray that it will be contagious. Hallelujah. You've given us the command to do it, Lord God, and you've given us instructions on how to do it, even through hard situations. Science and psychology have given us the, the, the medical reasons why these things are incredible. So, Lord Jesus, we've got every reason to do the right thing, Lord God, and we're going to choose to be grateful and thankful, Lord God, in all situations. We thank you, Lord, for this time, and we pray that as we continue today, Lord, let it not just be singing songs, but, Lord, let it be thankful appreciation singing of happy songs lord of the goodness you've done lord in the future that we anticipate in jesus name we pray amen, amen.